Good afternoon again, everybody. It's good to be in church with everyone. Uh, turn with us today to the book of Genesis and the 10th chapter. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about the 10th chapter and then uh, move right into the 11th chapter. Genesis chapter 10 is where we will be. someone here today that is lost that hears the gospel of your son. We pray, Lord, for their salvation. We ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. All right, Genesis 10 is where we are. You'll notice if you uh, skim through Genesis 10 right quick that it is a genealogy, and what it is, it is a genealogy of uh, those who have come post-flood. Of course, we know, we know that Noah, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are there. But then it goes on to their sons, their grandsons, and their great-grandsons. And so as we look at this, the approximation of people on the earth at this time could be in the tens of thousands. We're not given an exact number of that, but it could be in the tens of thousands without a doubt. And so as we look at the 10th chapter uh, you'll notice names that look like cities you have probably seen in the Old Testament. And that is because these people were the ones that started these cities. These cities, these places were named after them, many of them still around today. And so in Genesis chapter 10, starting in the first verse, it says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and uh, Mattai, Javan, Tubal, uh, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, uh, Ashkenaz, and Rephath, uh, Togamar, I'm not sure if I'm saying these correctly. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, uh, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these, the isle, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nation. So let us stop right there for just a moment. The gen Genesis, as we said, as we started our series in this book, the word Genesis in the Hebrew means beginnings or origin, and that's what the book of Genesis is all about. It's about beginnings and origins. We've seen the beginnings of the creation. Um, you have two options in life, basically. You can believe the biblical account of creation or you can believe in evolution. There's really no two other ways about it. There is no marrying of evolution and the account of creation in the Bible. Um, they are two completely different accounts. And so I believe without question that the account in the Word of God is accurate. Um, and so we, we have the beginning of that accounted for in the Bible. We have the answer to why man and why the world is the way it is in the Bible. We have the fall of man recorded and and sin first entering into the world. Uh, we have the first prophecies of the Lord that will come. We have the first institution, which is marriage of Adam and Eve. And on and on and on we could go. The, the book of Genesis is a, a book of beginnings. One question that is, is most definitely a, a thought-worthy question is where did all the different people come from and the different languages? What we read just now in the fifth verse is a short synopsis and continuing on throughout the 10th chapter is just a short synopsis or snapshot of what the world is becoming and why there are different tongues and nations and lands. The 11th chapter is the story of that. Lord willing, we'll get into the 11th chapter in the Tower of Babel today. And so... Why uh, are there different tongues? Why are there different families in their nations? Well, we'll answer to why there are different tongues 
and why there are different families, hopefully here in just a moment. Um, but it goes on to say, and it's going to give us some important names that we want to remember. So in the sixth verse, it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, uh, sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, uh, Phut, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havaliah, Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabticha, uh, the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan, and Cush begat, now here's an important one, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And so, if we were to skip ahead, um, the Bible tells us in the 32nd verse of Genesis chapter 10, These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So, the, the very last verse tells us that uh, this is an account of the people who had spread out, who had moved across the earth. But they had to be made to be moved to spread out across the earth. You remember in the story what we looked at when, Gen when Noah and his family came off of the ark. God's command to them was to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, it says. Man was to spread out, and man was to continue on telling each other about God, about the flood, about God's judgment, about God's statutes as far as they knew them at this time. The 10th chapter tells us, though, that eventually everything was spread out. Um, you can actually take uh, the three sons of Noah, and you can actually trace the pilgrimage. Um, one son, I believe it is Japheth, uh, it will be him that we would see people becoming what we would consider today to be Europeans or Russians, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, of course, Ham and his family. You have, of course, Canaan, and uh, the, other, the others from Ham's family would have spread out into Asia, into Africa. And, of course, Japheth, which is where uh, we have the people of Israel and where they would come from, uh, from Abraham, Abraham being in the line of Japheth. So here we are told that they were spread out, but now we're going to give them the story of what the world was like before they were spread out, and we're going to give the answer of why there are so many uh, different languages in the world and also why people look so very different as well. And another great lesson that we will learn from this 11th chapter is the lesson that Solomon wrote in, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, that there is nothing new under the sun. And you'll see what I mean when we get to that. So Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So we are roughly at this period or point in time in the 11th chapter. Remember, the 10th chapter is kind of giving us a, a, a big snapshot, and now we're actually going back in time in the 11th chapter to what predates the 10th chapter to give us information as to why the 10th chapter is the way it is and why things are the way they are now. And so here it tells us that uh, they were all journeying together. We are roughly 100 years removed from the flood uh, is about where we are. And here in 100 years time, we already see the problem that man has. The problem that man has is rebellion. Um, they were already told when they got off the ark, to go, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And they're not doing that. Uh, they were traveling together, and everybody in the earth at this time, which probably numbered somewhere in the tens of thousands, probably somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 people, um, everybody understood each other. Everybody spoke the same exact language. And when it says in the first verse, that the earth was of one language and one speech. It means that they had the same exact language and the same exact 
vocabulary so that everything was understood perfectly. And what I mean by that is uh, you can go to other countries that are, in fact, English-speaking countries, but you can say words uh, that we commonly use in our vocabulary, and it might mean something very, very different to what they use in their vocabulary. As a matter of fact, uh, you might find yourself quite embarrassed using some of what they use in their vocabulary. If you went there, they would look at you rather funny. Here, that was not a problem yet. It was not a problem. It was absolutely, everybody was on the same page. They were all on the same boat. Everyone understood completely what each other meant. You can even travel a few hours away from here, and the vocabulary is a little different. I don't remember, this has been a number of years ago. I don't remember where we were at if we were... Um, I think we were up north somewhere, maybe Columbus, but maybe we weren't. Dusty might remember. But I remember we sat down to a uh, we sat down at a restaurant, and the waiter asked us, uh, "What would you like to drink?" And Dusty said, "Sweet tea, please." She was very polite and smiled. He said, "We have iced tea with sugar in it. That's sweet tea. That is sweet tea. You you've defined the ingredients of sweet tea." Yeah. Um, but, you know, just a little bit removed from this area, the vocabulary changes a little bit. You know, one of the big, big memes uh, that goes around in our area is uh, you, they took the guy off Lord of the Rings and said, you know, in, in Lawrence County or Southern Ohio, you don't simply just uh, call, call the sweet, sugary beverage soda. You call it pop. And if you go somewhere else, they call it soda. A lot of places don't call it pop. So that's just kind of a, a, a small example here. At this time, none of that went on. Everybody understood everyone's vocabulary absolutely perfectly. They were all journeying together. They were all in the same boat. And they had a leader. And that is where we back up into the 10th chapter once again. And that name that I told you, which will be important in the 8th verse, Nimrod. Nimrod would be the leader of this company of people. It says he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, when it talks about the phrase of him being a mighty one, uh, it's talking about him being a warrior. He's killed people. Um, there's a lot in the Hebrew language that is missed when we translate it into English, but this man was a killer. He was, he was violent. He was strong. He was powerful. And he was a mighty hunter. Um, he was, he was, had a, a very good skill at hunting. And so they kind of placed him as, as being the leader, and, and people followed him as he was a mighty one in the earth. Now, already we, we can begin to see problems here. We see problems with the fact that they weren't dispersing and replenishing the earth. And we see problems with the fact that they are following a man that is known to be a killer known to uh, be able to draw people in by his might, by his charisma, by all of those things. See, the flood was an example and a beginning of starting again, but the flood never solved the problem that man has. Remember when we looked into um, the, the ninth chapter here, we stated that, you know, one of the problems, or the biggest problem, was that, yes, Noah and his family, they were saved on the ark along with all the animals, but sin entered the ark as well, in Noah and his family. And sin came off of that ark as well. And so sin is, is just continuing on its spread. They are following a man um, they are not dispersing. They, as a matter of fact, say, no, we're going to dwell here. And they're not so far removed from, from the people that were on the very ark and the next generation of people that were children to the ones that were on the ark. They are not very far away from moved from this. Just a few generations. So those people, I, I don't remember about Noah, but I know that as far as his sons go, his sons are still alive. So there's still first account, first-hand knowledge of 
what God had done, what God had commanded, what the world was like at this time. And the Bible tells us we're told that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I don't think that Noah stopped preaching once the flood was over, once he got off the ark. He probably still continued teaching and preaching and telling people about God as more and more people came to be on this earth. But it is in man's lost nature. It is in man's lost nature. It is in man's carnality to rebel against God and to go the opposite way. That is in man's nature without question. And he will do that and we see it here. And we see it in society time and time and time again. And so these people here decide they will follow this man rather than following the Lord. They would dwell there in that place rather than dispersing. And the third verse um, of Genesis chapter 11 dispels a, a popular myth that is passed along uh, to people in our day and age. It says in Genesis 11, 3, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. The word slime here uh, in the Hebrew, it, it literally means, um, it means asphalt. Um, these people were people of ingenuity. They were highly intelligent people that could do things and do stuff. We, in our day and age, consider ourselves to be so very advanced, but really we're not. We, we, we don't know how to do stuff like generations ago did. Generations ago knew how to do things. The, the popular secular scientific teaching is that early man was a Neanderthal, that he wasn't very intelligent, that he, he came along grunting along, came from ape and all that. Um, but yet in our day and age, we still can't figure out how the pyramids were built. We don't know how they did these massive, wonderful stone structures, how they built them, how they got the, the materials from point A to point B. They can never explain how they did that. Here we already see a little bit of the ingenuity of man that God had placed into man. Um, I have news for you. You know, as... as Time goes on, the degeneration of our DNA becomes more and more and becomes greater. And that's a fancy way for me to say that man is not getting smarter. We are learning new things, don't get me wrong. We have technology, don't get me wrong. There are areas that God has blessed us immensely. But we're not getting better nor smarter. People back in this time knew how to do things. Back up just to, to my grandfather. My grandfather uh, quit school, I think, in the 7th or 8th grade to go work in the coal mines. We would think, well, he didn't go very far in school, did he? Uh, that man knew how to build. That man knew how to cook. That man knew how to lay block. He knew how to wire. He knew how to plumb. He knew how to start fires. He knew how to do things. And when I say he knew how to wire things, he knew, he figured out in his own mind um, how to put, this has been a number of years ago, a number of years ago. I was still in high school, so it's been before the year 2000. He figured out how to uh, wire his bathrooms so that the water in the shower and the sinks would automatically come out warm. And they would come out at a preset temperature. This was back, like I said, before I was out of school. Those things are out now today. He did them back then. People knew how to do stuff. And, and these people knew how to do things. They knew how to build. So don't be caught in, in the trap of, of thinking that the people here in this day and age were not smart people. They were, they were very intelligent people. Their buildings... And, and all of those things show us, uh, look back to music from a few hundred years ago and the complexities of music from a few hundred years ago from people like Mozart and Beethoven and so forth and so on and compare it to uh, popular music today and the wonderful lyri lyrical content of music today and, and tell me we've gotten smarter.
don't think so. I don't think so. And so man, unfortunately, is getting worse. But we see that man here was very intelligent. Adam and Eve were very intelligent people. And so here's what they did, though. And here's where we really start getting into issues and into problems. It says in the fourth verse of Genesis 11, And they said, Go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And we'll stop reading right there for just a moment. There are those um, who are much smarter than me, without question, who tend to think that idolatry and, and those things have already crept their way into this society. And they might be right. Um, there are these things that have been uncovered in Mesopotamia. They're called ziggurats. What a ziggurat is, it is a tower for idolatry. And at the very top, they would build them tall. They would build them high. Um, they have their origins in Egypt. Not only in Egypt, but they carried on through to Babylon. And at the top of these towers would be their idol. Uh, there would be idol worship there, and you, we've, we've talked about that many times before, about what that entails. Um, and so there, there is most definitely that, that possibility there. Um, there's no way we're going to finish this message today, so I'm, I'm going to come to a close here in just a moment, so bear with me. So there is that possibility that there was idolatry already going on, but that's not what sticks out to me personally the most. You see, as we look through here, and we can see how quickly man can fade away from the place where he needs to be. Noah and his sons left the ark. Sin came with them, as we've seen obviously in the ninth chapter. Sin came with them. Problems came. They began to fulfill the command of, of replenishing the earth and multiplying. But as the multiplying began, Man began less and less to believe what he has been told about God. Even from people who were right there and experienced it. And what sticks out to me the most about this fourth verse and about this story at the Tower of Babel is not whether or not they had idolatry going on. Not, not any of that. What sticks out to me the most, and we said that what we would learn uh, today, and we would compare it to what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, where there is nothing new under the sun. You know, what we see here, I think, in this fourth verse in the 11th chapter is the exact equivalence of what we see happening in our day and age. See, idolatry isn't a big thing in our day and age anymore. But what is the big thing in our day and age? It's something called humanism. It's humanism. It's I can do it my way. I can make my own path. I can choose what I want. And, and that is okay. And that is, own, and that, and that is fine. These people did that very thing. They said, go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name. You see, they were all about making themselves a name. They were all about them. We are going to do this. And man was never created for that purpose. You look at people today, the world is becoming worse as far as um, atheism is concerned. People not... Not even believing there's a God. But then you also have people today who, while they believe that there is a God, they will not follow what we are told to be the truth of Scripture. They hear the testimony from their own family, from those who have firsthand knowledge. But yet they say, I want to do it my way. Well, that's what you believe. That's what you believe in. You go ahead and believe that. It's okay if you believe that. I'm, I'm going to believe this. But you see, here's, here's an important point. What I, what I want to believe isn't important. And what you want to believe isn't important. 
It's what God tells us the truth is, is what's important. And I've experienced enough over these 20 years of being on this road to know that this is the truth. You know, here they said, we are going to build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. We are going to do this. Man today says, we can make our own way to God. But you couldn't be further from the truth. The Bible says then in the next verse, and we'll come to a close here in just a second, I promise. The Bible says in the fifth verse, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Now, here's the important things to note about this. One, the Lord didn't have to come down per se. He knew what they were doing. This is a, a, a using of words here so that we can get a, a mental description. It says, the Lord came down to see the tower which the children of men built. You see, man was so proud of this tower that he was building that was going to reach up so very high. Man here in Genesis chapter 11, uh, man, the, the people here thought we are just at our peak. We are at our best. We are building a tower that's going to reach unto heaven. Is that any different than the societies of today that says we accept everyone. We are loving. We are wonderful. and We are going to make our own way. Is it any different? I don't think it is. And the thing that is absolutely the same as this is that no matter how good man thinks he is, in order for man and God to come together, the Lord always has to come down to where man is because man cannot reach up that high. Amen. That's the story of the gospel. That is the story of God giving his son at the cross of Calvary. See, no one, I don't care where they come from, I don't care who they are, I don't care what kind of wonderful moral life they think that they perhaps have lived, they will never be good enough to make it to God by their own doing. God had to come down to us. And you have to understand that if you want to, to make it to heaven, if you want to see your creator one day, you can't do it your way. You have to do it the way that God says you have to do it. Man doesn't get to make his own rules about the things of God. God does that. God tells us we don't get to say, well, this is what I think. This is what I believe. It's laid out for us in the book. The Bible tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the word of God tells us. It tells us that God came near unto us, gave his son to die on a cruel tree, resurrected the third day so that anyone could be saved. And trust me, everyone needs saved. The Bible tells us as Sister Mildred comes, the Bible tells us that in the book of Romans it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All that's everybody. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. It tells us in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it also tells us in the book of Romans that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then a little bit later in that chapter it says these words, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everybody needs it. The world is no different than what it was during this time period. Everybody tries to think that they have some type of answer, that they have uh, a way that they can go, but listen. God has to come down to us. We can't make our way up to Him as we stand. What number do you have? Page 119 as we stand. 